Good afternoon or morning or evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Keenan Krauss, and I am the Hart House Student Debate and Dialogue Committee's Director of Arts and Culture. Um, so before beginning um, and meeting our guests, I would like to start this event by acknowledging the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, this land has been the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Throughout our conversation today, we hope to explore what more universities can do beyond a land acknowledgement to truly engage Indigenous knowledge and perspectives into the academic environment. So the Hart House Student Debate Dialogue Community is pleased to be partnering with Demo, the Hart House Music Magazine, to present this evening's discussion on the role of creativity through times of crisis. Our committee works hard to find the most prominent issues affecting our world and begin together to engage in meaningful conversations on these pressing topics. And tonight will be no exception. Today's discussion brings together a group of incredible artists to speak on the value of art in crisis and give insights on how to navigate challenging times while sticking to one's artistic pursuits, whether professionally or recreationally. I'm grateful to be moderating this panel alongside my friend and event co-planner, Zain Ahmed. Tonight's event will begin with a moderated discussion until 6 p.m., at which point we'll transfer into breakout rooms for everyone to have small discussions with one of tonight's speakers. During the panel discussion, I must ask everyone to keep the microphones muted and hold your questions until the breakout rooms, at which time you'll have a chance to ask your questions. So without further ado, let's introduce tonight's speakers. And before quickly doing that, I just want to let you know that um, this event has closed captioning, which you can access at the bottom if you need or desire. So in terms of tonight's speakers, first we have Natalie Burton, who is an award-winning multidisciplinary artist from Toronto with roots in the Mission El Mackinac and Mississippi. Natalie's current body of work focuses on positive images of Indigenous people as a means of confronting the romanticized depictions as seen through art history. She focuses especially on the women role models who have impacted her. Natalie's art has been featured in exhibits and galleries across the country. She's recently co-founded the New Breathe Projects during the pandemic and bringing into discussion indigenous experiences and resilience and the history of pandemic and plagues. So the next artist who we're excited to have tonight is Colton Curtis. Colton is an actor from Canada's East Coast. Colton has trained in Canada, the US and Italy while performing with Charlottetown Festival, the Shaw Festival, and most recently, the Stratford Festival. Since starting at the Stratford Festival in 2016, Colton has performed A Chorus Line, Guide and Dolls, HMS Pinafore, The Music Man, Rocky Horror, and Billy Elliot. Very excitingly, Colton has also launched his own photography business in July of 2020. And finally, he can also be seen as a roots model in the recent national campaign. Uh, next, we have Savvy Souza, um, the self-proclaimed queen of floss pop, who has been releasing melodic pops since, since 2016. With fan favorites such as Cloudboy and Xanax, Savvy plays around with dreamy lyricism, metaphors, and melodies dripping of sweetness. Savvy released her breakout Cream and Frosting in late 2019, which saw success on TikTok. It was produced by Rosin Collection duo House of Wolf. The song sits at 3 million streams on Spotify, and she is now signed with Crown Records, um, which is an imprint of 300 Entertainment. She sees the floss pop genre as something to be adopted by others and a way of marking her place in the pop world. So get ready for what she calls a bubblegum infusion of new music set to be released soon. And finally, and most certainly not least, with over a decade of experience, Tainomi Banks is a world-class drag entertainer. Recognized best for her full production performances, Tainomi dominates a stage with a rating of powerful and playful energy. Her hustle led her to become the first drag entertainer to perform in Toronto Dundas Square during World Pride 2014. And Tanomi was also featured in international campaigns with Netflix and IKEA. 
In 2019, she became the first drag entertainer to be the trophy bearer at the seventh annual Canadian Screen Awards. You can also catch Naomi on season one of Canada's Drag Race on Crave. So welcome to all my speakers and thank you so much for joining us. So let's get right to it and start with some questions. So my first question goes to Natalie. So while everyone is kind of looking forward ahead towards a post-pandemic world, since the early days of the outbreak of Canada or uh, the outbreak of COVID in Canada, you've been looking at the past and looking at the experiences of pandemics and plagues and specifically how they've impacted indigenous communities. So can you spend a few minutes uh, speaking on your brief project and where ins ins inspiration came from? Sure, Th thanks for having me. I think it's uh, absolutely fabulous to be able to come together like this online uh, despite the pandemic. I mean, I'm old enough to re remember when uh, we had to get off the couch to turn the dial on the TV set. So this, <laughs> this is fabulous. Um, so the Breathe Project, um, yeah, it actually didn't start like that. Uh, when when I first heard of the the pandemic and how it was going to actually finally be coming to Canada, um, you know, we'd been watching what was happening around the world, and yes, it was kind of scary, especially I was as it was coming closer. It was bound to get to Canada. Um, you know, like a lot of artists, um, I was in the middle of doing things. I just published my first book. Um, and then boom, on the day of my birthday, the World Health Organization decides to declare the global pandemic, you know, so it was like, okay, I guess we're not doing anything for a while. Um, but I took that as a way to, well, okay, this is an opportunity. Let's maybe look at what we can do. Um, now I've got all this free time. I can do all those projects that I've been wanting to do, you know? Um, and, and to me, it's, it seems natural that when crisis hits, artists, artists get to work. It, it's just, it's the perfect time to create. Um, but it wasn't long after that, that I started realizing that not many people were creating, at least not on social media. Um, being a Métis, um, a lot of our culture is about beadwork and putting our thoughts and feelings into our beadwork. And we bead everything. I mean, it's one of those things, it's in our blood. Um, but I wasn't seeing anything out there. And so I put the question out on Facebook and said, you know, where's all the beaded artwork? This seems to be like the time to be able to, to produce. And um, my friend, Lisa Shepard, who is a fabulous bead worker uh, who lives out in BC, actually contacted me the next day. And from that conversation, we came to realize that a lot of artists were actually blocked. I think the shock of the pandemic um, and just not knowing where to, what to do. I mean, it's basic survival that we're thinking about. What, where's the next, next paycheck gonna come from? Where's, you know, di different things like that, like practical things like that, that, that were blocking people and not knowing how to deal with it. Um, because Lisa and I are both Métis, um, I mean, I lost my great grandmother to tuberculosis. She's in a um, mass grave in North Bay. Um, and that's not that long ago. So for many, many, Indigenous people, you know, it hasn't been that long since we've been touched by pandemics and various diseases and things like that. So all of these conversations um, Lisa and I had about, um, you know, well, what could we do to help artists, first of all, but also to help try to figure out how we're going to get people to put their feelings out into an art project and maybe help them move forward. So that that's the beginning of Breathe. The rest is history from there, I guess. Well, it was quite an amazing initiative. And when I came across it, I know that it, I was just amazed and excited that that kind of work was still being done. So thank you, first of all. Um, and so you kind of talked about how these times are periods of when artists tend to create, you know, the time to create. Um, but like the pandemic, has impacted the entire art community, um, but some arts are more marketable and adaptable during pandemic. So Colton, for you specifically, um, just to bring you in, um, you have had to take a bit of a pause from theater, but this has seemed to 
have given you some freedom to pursue some other uh, art forms. So especially with your photography, which you launched in the summer. So can you speak about you know, how you try to navigate the disproportionate impact across different forms of art? Yeah, um, so like you said, we were, uh, I was in Stratford, Ontario rehearsing Chicago the Musical and it was set to open. Uh, we were actually about to do a run through on stage with the orchestra the day that work was canceled. So we got an email and at that point we all kind of thought, oh, this might last a week, maybe two weeks, but we'll be back on stage. Don't worry, the show must go on. Um, and as the weeks went by, it slowly crept in that, you know, this wasn't gonna happen the same way that we thought it would. So it actually took a while for me to kind of um, pivot or find it, find even the, um, the passion to start creating something again. And for so long, I'd, I've been working in theater at, at the Stratford Festival. This would have been my fifth season. So uh, it's easy to become a bit complacent in that. You know, your schedule is fairly um, the same every year. You start in February and you go all the way to November or whatever. Um, and I was really comfortable in that. And I think the pandemic kind of like was like a car crash for me. I was like, whoa, all right. I actually there's been a lot of things that I've really been passionate about that I just have made up the excuse that I don't have the time to pursue this right now you know I'm busy working whatever um and it was probably about like a month into the pandemic when I had like an epiphany of wake up you're I was so bored I was just waking up every day like ugh, what am I gonna do today to get through the day um and there's only so many dance classes on Zoom that you can take before you're drained. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's only so many YouTube videos you can watch of live theater before you think you're just like, you know, your heart, your heart breaks every time you watch it. Um, so that's when I, I had been taking photos for a few years prior to this happening. And um, I guess the business aspect of my photography started uh, in April, May, I, I picked up my camera again and, and I thought, you know what, I also need to make money. And uh, this is something I'm really passionate about. Why not just see what happens? And um, we'll discuss like the use of uh, social media later, but it was really interesting for me to see how that took off really quickly. And it was also interesting to see a bunch of other artists that I was working with in the theater business, all of a sudden pivot to find new ways to be creative and artistic during this time. Um, and that looked different for everyone as far as, far as my circle of friends. Um, so yeah, I guess I guess it was like halfway through April when I, I kind of said enough is enough. I, I need to figure out a way to just start creating. And then once that happened, it was like the ball was rolling and it didn't stop. And I sometimes I feel weird saying this, but I've had a really successful year in terms of how creatively fulfilled I feel. I, I f I'm very thankful in a strange way. <laughs> Anyway, zip that for now. <laughs> yeah, um, so much like uh, your art being sort of performance-based and then pivoting to another model, um, for Savvy and Tainomi, I know both of you work in fields that are sort of heavily con um, concentrated on the aspect of performance, so like concerts or live performance. So I was just wondering, how does that um, impact how you both have worked and how you've found ways to sort of create alternative platforms? Um, whoever wants to go uh, first, really, I guess, Sabi. Oh, you're muted. It is. <laughs> um, I was wondering, Tainomi, did you want to go first, just because you do have a lot more uh, performance experience than I do? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, it's true, it's true. <laughs> I'm like, all right, uh, throw me the bow and girl, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> how did I do this? Um, honestly, just going off of what um, Colton said, it was really hard in the beginning, honestly, like I, and I, I'm going to tell you guys this, I literally sat in my room, like after like two weeks, and I literally just had like, such an emotional cry. And like just tears, I was like crying for like, maybe an hour, just no, like, and I can't even describe to you what that felt like, I just needed to cry and everything. Because it's like, my life was so like, I had everything set like five shows a week and then booking after booking after booking and I and really it came to question I'm like am I I literally was asking questions like to myself like is, am I good enough like what am I going to create next so like the, the like that kind of dread came over because it's like 
I'm so like the people's people. Like I go out, I'm hugging, interacting, um, making jokes, uh, stories, connecting with people and, and building relationships. And then all of that just basically got taken away from me. But quickly after that cry, I was like, okay, hello, wake the hell up. Who are you? Okay, I am Tainomi. Okay, so we just got <laughs> together, collected myself and literally, um, you know what it was a beautiful thing? Um, like uh, Natalie was saying, we have so much time. And I literally, the fans, my friends, I like people, like I'm always like, oh, I'm so busy. Like I have an hour for you. But now it's like, I have a lot of hours and I've been talking to people across the world. Like everyone's on online and it's easy now. And like, literally what kind of excuse can I make? Or my friends, you know how I call someone up and they're like, oh, sorry, text me girl. No, 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 you're at home. <laughs> answer your phone and talk to me so me connecting with people actually brightened my spirit um, made me want to do things I was like I talk to my mom every like so often now I talk to her every day and I'm just finding about so many stories she has and like my I just found like my relationships with people have helped me creative the creative um, my creative spirit just grow and want to do more things so that's it's almost like to shorten, to give you a shortened answer, you just go to the mirror, look at yourself and be like, hey, you could do it. <laughs> like, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. You can make it, girl. That's kind of what I did. Um, I wanted to follow up with a question. So you're talking about how you've been really connecting with people online and you had a really significant milestone with Candace Drag Race, which I personally loved so much. Um, and I think cultivating a whole new fan base at that time, um, what was the experience like for you uh, and how did you find it connecting to this whole new fan base at the time with that? The experience, the experience on the show? Uh, or like the post-show success that you probably found? It was just hard. <laughs> I just want to be like, uh, it's such, I, if I could find the word to describe the show itself and what I felt, it felt like Hunger Games without like killing people. But it's like, but in the best way, I honestly, mm -hmm. because like, I didn't realize I was set in my ways. So like when I went to the show that, so you, I mean, you obviously saw the show, a lot of my friends who know me are like, oh, you were in your head. I'm like, yeah, I was. Because like, I didn't, I'm so in control of my my brand and what I do. And in the show, it's, it's like a playground. Like they're like, oh, do this today. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> like you can see me working through it um which I honestly that's what I'm grateful for I I didn't know I that I was like that about me and so it was like I learned a new part of my my you know a new part of Tainomi and like I I should let loose more and you know have more fun with things and um after the show we were promised so many things like tours and stuff like that and like for all of us and you know what the thing is you know what I had to remind myself everyone is in the same position. It's not like it just happened to me and like, oh, what was me, like my karma? No, no, everyone's in the same thing. So I just can, you can't be selfish and be like, oh, because like my friend who I want to cry to is, he's like, girl, like I have no job. So <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, oh yeah. Like, so you really, I don't know, a sense of a like woke, like wokeness it just happens. And you just, I don't know, just, it, it just turns into like positive love and like everyone understands each other right away. And I just found that like that spark between humans, like it's just, it's, it's there and it's actually uplifting and helpful. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. I answered that question. I'm like, like going yeah, off. Definitely did. That was, that was really great. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Sabi sort of the same question um, about performance spaces. All right, go ahead, Sab. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, no, the reason why, I mean, I asked Tainomi to go first is because Tainomi has so much incredible experience, like, from all across Toronto and just all over Canada. I mean, it's amazing. But um, for me, 2020 was, like, definitely a milestone of a year for me. And I went into the year, like, doing a couple gigs here and there. I had done my first show at, like, The Drake, which, like, every little new artist does whenever, you know, they're set to debut. But um, I mean, there was like tour talks and opening talks and, you know, things that I definitely did miss out on performance wise because of the pandemic. 
and like even thing big milestones like signing my label deal like instead of the whole champagne glass you know sitting around with a big group of label heads it was really just me and my computer and a pdf and a copy and paste signature like it was not cute it was just it was it was boring but um i sat around for a while honestly kind of dreading why i was so sad about it i would see like other artists and they were doing so well and I was always comparing myself to like the American girls and how much you know they're putting out music now and they're shooting now and they're doing this like nothing's happening but we have to recognize like we're all going through this pandemic like we may be in Canada but you know we have different restrictions and we just need to abide to them and work around it and I, this may be a controversial take but as a creative I feel like this time I would have never had gotten if the pandemic had never happened like it really was such a blessing in like a really messed up way. I know that like sucks to be heard, but I, I'm really grateful for this time at home and this time to really find myself as an artist and appreciate my creativity because I mean, I feel like we can all agree on this, but the pandemic has really like opened up our third eye and made us find, made us find um, like so much different parts of our creative sides that we haven't seen. Like before I could only like write a couple songs per week. Now I'm like writing 10 songs a day. So I don't know, I'm, I'm really happy to be at home. I mean, I, every, not everybody has the luxury to, but as a creative, I'm just very happy for this time, even though ooh, my AirPods falling out, even though um, we did have to give up things like live performances and, you know, I would have loved to tour and things like that, but there will always be a time for that. We just gotta be grateful for the time we're in now. Yeah, very, very well put. I like that. Um... Well, I think like, again, looking at the alternative of touring and doing concerts, can I guess the question for you and for everyone is the question about the online platforms or the social media. So, you know, Savvy, like your can uh, cream and uh, frosting blew up on TikTok. Like that is, you got so much views. And there is a question that sometimes that is debated about whether these online platforms like TikTok or Instagram, you know, devalue art in people's eyes or has it kind of provided an important outlet for making art more accessible? So like, I think that's, yeah, Tanomi. Sorry, I love that you said that. It's, it's, and it's a short answer. I, TikTok is the worst and the best at the same time. Um, I've literally learned so many things that I wouldn't have learned. Like, you know, I know Google's there, but like just how, I don't know, just like, people are so there. Like uh, someone from Germany just posted this thing and you're like, what? I don't know. It's just like, it, and and it's just such a, te it's a, what is it called? A seesaw. So it's like kind of, it's kind of weird. It's like, there's bad, a lot of bad shit. You're like, okay, how did you even go viral on this bull? And then all of a sudden you just see this other artist and everything. And then um, I, there's definitely a balance that has to be made, but, I, I don't know. It's like, it's very devil angel, <laughs> like, uh, kind of situation. So that's what I have to say about that. Yeah, Natalie. Um, you know, the, the thing about social media is, is one thing that I've learned is that there's going to be garbage everywhere. And so you have to learn how to use it smartly, you know, um, <laughs> with us, it, it, social media helped the breathe project explode. I mean, within two weeks, we had over a 1000 members. Um, the Smithsonian was calling artists to buy their work. And other, you know, uh, galleries around the world and museums around the world were contacting artists to buy the work that they were producing through this project. We even had a couple of museums here who wanted to buy the entire collection that's going on tour, we ended up, you know, uh, being able to organize um, you know, a couple of um, calls for submissions um, to get them on tour across Canada. And we also have another tour that hopefully will start in the US. And this couldn't have happened without social media, you know. But at the same time, we based the project on our values of community and reciprocity and respect. Um, and I, that touches on something what, that Tainomi was saying, because I think it's very, very, very important. The reason why social media is, is working in these instances is because of the community aspect and people needing to reach out and be together and people needing to have that 
communication and contact. So community, having built that project on the thoughts, our, our, our teachings, our Métis teachings of um, community and reciprocity really, 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 really helped this project bloom in a way that was responsible and focused and also a safe space for people to interact and to come together, learn from each other. And in that way, it brings things like, you know, that whole reconciliation subject matter um, to the forefront as well, because now that everybody's going through the pandemic together, we can sit down on that even platform and have those conversations about this is what happened to us. Oh, I get it now, you know, because it's happened to us now. So anyways, that's what I have to say. <laughs> Colton, Colton, you go first. <laughs> um, I have a love-hate relationship, kind of like Tainomi said. Um, my main platform at the beginning of the pandemic was Instagram. And when I started this photography business, it blew up, which was great. Not blew up, but it, it happened quickly, which I really appreciated because it um, you know, made me money. It helped. But then I kind of was realizing by posting this free content every day, I'm giving up, you know, hours and hours of work that I've done in an instant for, for maybe nothing. I'm not sure what's happening with that now that it's out in the universe, right? So I think about that a lot, actually, because um, over the winter, I kind of took a step back from social media. And I, re I don't know the answer, really, whether or not it's better to just constantly throw things out there and hope that something lands and sticks and works, or if maybe that's a bit of a waste of something that you've, you know, spent hours laboring over that you love and that means so much to you personally, um, as far as, you know, the art of it all. <laughs> um, anyway, that's where my head is on that topic at the moment. Yeah, awesome. Tabby, do you have any things you want to add before we move on? Oh, I love TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I'm biased. But the thing is, like Tyler said, it is a seesaw. Like there is a lot of like garbage and nonsense and people go viral for the stupidest things. I mean, we can look at Gorilla Glue Gate as like the, the catalyst of this past week. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's educational. It's There's definitely, there's a big educational aspect to TikTok. And I'm definitely grateful to be on the app and it's, it's, it's so weird what goes viral and what doesn't, but I honestly think it's an excellent platform for anybody to just put stuff out there because you never know who you're going to reach. That's like all social media, but right now I feel like with TikTok, everybody's on there. So you just got to put yourself out there, but yeah. Yeah, so that was, that was great. Um, one thing with TikTok is I guess in content creators, they always feel the need to sort of push out more content. Um, and I think it's the same with artists. Do you guys, how have you guys been combating the pressure to sort of always be producing or creating art during the pandemic or also just more broadly in other times of hardship in your life? Whoever, Natalie, we'll go with you first. Um, well, I have to admit that at, at some point because, um, you know, the Breathe Project did basically take over my life and I wasn't able to produce my own work. Um, and so I did experience burnout by uh, the fall, just going through because, you know, keep in mind too, it's also a, a grassroots project and we weren't getting paid money unless somebody bought something, let's say. So, you know, but it's something that needs to be nurtured constantly, like the relationships and the group and everything else and moderation and all that kind of stuff. And because other galleries and, and venues were involved and, you know, there was even a couple of, of um, large organizations who shockingly tried to co-opt the idea. So, you know, the whole aspect of copyright and this and that, and, and people just taking, you know, it's, it, that goes against the values of reciprocity, <laughs> you know? Um, so, you know, I did experience burnout and had to realize that you need to take a step back. And I know that this has happened to other artists as well, that, you know, you can't always be producing because at some point it's no longer authentic to who you are, you know, um, it's, 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 uh, you know, you're, you're doing things just to please other people. So it, it, it's a fine line. You really have to take a step back and think, you know, what is, what is the benefit to me at this point in time? Am I just going to burn out and, you know, cheapen my art or 
you know, or what. So the other thing I wanted to point out is something that Colton said is one of the things that we struggle, we struggle as visual artists is, you know, how do you put your paintings up online? You know, how is somebody going to go and spend that kind of money to buy an actual real piece of artwork when they can just go online and see that image? Um, and so that's a tough, tough line to cross as well. It's something that we think about quite often. Um, and, you know, it's the whole, you know, do I post a little res pic and hope that they'll go to the gallery to see it, you know? <laughs> so, so I get that, I get that whole question as well. Anyway, hopefully that answered. Yeah, that was perfect. Uh, does anyone else want to give an answer there? Can you rephrase the question again or just ask it again? Yeah, so um, it was just talking um, or asking how you combat the pressure to sort of always be producing or creating art during not only just the pandemic, but also just other times of hardship in your life. Yeah, I feel personally, um, it all of a sudden becomes less producing for others to give and to sell or whatever the art form is. And all of a sudden it's more of the, I'm enriching myself and I'm kind of, uh, you know, charging myself up. And I still charge myself up by creating, which is funny. It's just a different way of creating, or maybe you're just taking risks that you're not quite ready to share yet or um, it's a, maybe it's a totally different art form. Like I kind of felt that way about pivoting, well, not that it was my choice, but you know, stop performing in theater, um, which after so long it did, I guess I did experience burnout at times. And then all of a sudden taking this time to um, remember what it is that I love to do, which is at, at the heart of it is to create. So, you know, let me explore, let me explore visual art. Let me explore choreography. Let me explore, you know, the list goes on. Um, so I think to answer the question, it's less about producing for others and more about what can I do that will feed me in this moment? Because that's also super important. How do you, I guess, yeah, Sabi, go ahead. No, oh, Keenan, go ahead, just, it's all good. No, no, please, please you go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, I feel like another thing too, as like creatives, we're always like, I don't want to say always, but a lot of the times we're pressured to use our side hobbies as hustles. And it's it's honestly like very exhausting, but it can also be very therapeutic because I mean, as creatives, at least with me, I always have a million things going on in my head. And I feel like if you just put out something and it sticks, like you can keep working with it and go on from there. But as a society, like we're told like, okay, you need to be doing this job. And then on top of that, you need to have like two side hustles. And this is how you're gonna be able to afford this and do this and this. And I feel like being in the pandemic, it has been even more pressure because like you're at home all day. What are you doing all day? Go do this, go do this. Start your like 10 figure side hustle, like da da da. But um, yeah there's been a huge burnout with that. I feel like along, a, a, sorry, amongst a lot of creatives because I feel like we're all pressured to turn like things that we find therapeutic on the side into like big hustles. And I don't know, I've definitely seen this like big push for like hustle culture throughout the pandemic. So, yeah. Well, I guess that kind of, again, really greatly connects to one of the things we want to talk about tonight, which was kind of something back from kind of the commercial aspects of art. And to talk about the value of art, because you know, as you just mentioned, there are benefits to art. Um, for you, as you know, the, obviously there's financial benefits, but there's also like a benefit to well-being and mental health. Um, and does anyone want to talk about like, you know, the kind of need for you to kind of put aside um, the commercial or financial aspects of what you do and how do you focus on the therapeutic or like the important parts of art and how could others, you know, how would you recommend others try to use and leverage art for those kind of same benefits? Yeah, Natalie? Well, um, th I mean, that, that's what the Breathe Project was all about. So it was basically to help people put their emotions into these, these ma created masks and, and to to be able to work through their emotions as they were working through them and then um, move, move forward. Um, you know, for me, 
the whole time working on it, and I'm still working on it, has been quite a roller coaster ride. It's been incredibly fulfilling for that, knowing that it's not a commercial project really at all. It didn't start out as being a commercial project. At its core value, it's not a commercial project. Um, it just so happens that we were able to create um, you know, platforms for artists to be able to sell and to be able to to show their art, which which I'm extremely proud of, but that's not the goal kind of thing. Um, you know, the 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 project itself is meant as a way to to be a driver for artists to work through their emotions. We also created Breathe for Education because we saw the importance of being able to work through the pandemic so that students could then create their masks and, and however subject matter that the, the teachers want to bring it into um, can help students work through so that they can become unblocked. Art is such an amazing way to help people that way uh, and, and to help people in, in a, a variety of different mental health practices. And it doesn't have to just be visual arts. It could be acting, singing, dancing, whatever, you know? I mean, one of the best things I like to do is going out in the middle of the bush and just, you know, singing at the top of my lungs for the hell of it, you know, hoping nobody's around to hear me as it echoes through the woods, right? But, you know, cause I don't have a great voice. But anyway, it, it's just one of those things. It's, it's, it's fun, it's creative, it's being able to let loose because ultimately you have to let go of that pressure, you know, and, and that's what it's all about. I know, I mean, uh, to put you on the spot a little bit, like, how do you know, you, again, talking back about how you're so kind of performative and so like live in the art you do, you know, how do you try to find art that is more meaningful to you personally? I'm so like, I, I don't know, I'm so in my feelings with things. So like, I honestly let my feelings lead lead me in a way um, because like everything what we're experiencing is so exhausting like especially and and to bring up like Black Lives Matter like I, I remember I feel I feel like every day last year like I was watching murder <laughs> like every minute and like that's like oh my god so like I so I so, so I totally understand what Colton was saying where he's like let me just shut off get off the social media and everything. So um, with performing and everything, everything's feelings and emotions and stuff like that. So um, you just have to take care of your mind and your and put you first. Um, so like things like, I hate working out, but like I started doing it in the apartment and like starting going for walks, literally, like I had a, a conversation with my mom and she's like, you are always mean. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I know I'm not usually like that but she's like you need to go work out and I'm like so I just just started doing it and I was like oh okay I actually should be doing this because I, I was dancing literally four times a week like five times a week and like that's where I got my frustrations out like through song dance connection to people and so I just I almost forgot that so it's like that's so this is why I say put you first your mind your body take care of that and that's and I think that's where the the battery gets refilled, and then that's that's what that sorry that process will help um, the mind and the body and it, it, the feeling of wanting to create. Yeah, I think that's a really important kind of message for a lot of people right now. Um, Colton, again, you're from there with you know getting out some emotions through dance and singing, even maybe. Um, okay, what kind of how have you been trying to use art for? your well-being um i mean i basically need to echo everything tainomi just said but uh i i kind of done like art that i i've created stuff that i don't want to share with anyone kind of like i alluded to it before um and and that's i think that's totally fine like maybe someday when i die it'll come up and everyone's gonna be like oh amazing but maybe not and that's okay too it's like a, a way of therapy for me is just to like literally like record myself dancing and not show anyone you know or or like pick up a paintbrush and paint something or take photos and again not show anyone and I think it's important that you know as artists we can still um, practice without sharing and I think 
going back to the social media thing, I think we live in a culture where we have to share everything. I don't know why, but that has been instilled in me. I just feel the need that I constantly, if I do anything, need to post it or tweet it or tell someone. And it, and I have slowly just learned that that is not it. Um, and I feel really, really great about having outlets that no one needs to know about. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. I, I, yeah, I was like that. Um, uh, Savi, any last thoughts I can have before we move on to the next topic? Um, no last thoughts. I'm pretty sure everyone hit that on the ball. It's been, I mean, it's been definitely a hard year. And creatively, like, I just finished writing my most recent project. And it's definitely, like, it's a, the production is going to be very, like, happy and, like, bubbly and very, like, fun. But this whole year, I mean, it's been so hard, like creatively, I feel like we've all been able to like put so much into our work, but like Ty Naomi said, there was so much horrible shit going on last year. Oh, sorry, my, my language. <laughs> like it was just, honestly, last year was a very terrible year. And um, I mean, it was a blessing and a curse, like I can say, but Colton, you were right about the whole, don't put everything on social media. I feel like with being a creative personality and even just putting out, you know, having your face out there, everyone expects you to, be always posting about what you're doing every single day. Like it's like a day in a life every single day. And it's exhausting. It feels sometimes like you're just putting on a show for everybody else and you don't really get to have your own personal life. So you got to find that balance. Um, Fabi, I found it really interesting when you're talking about how your next project is going to be sounding sort of really bubbly, but then it's kind of in stark contrast to how sort of dark the world is seeming right now. Um, and so, my question for all the artists right now is how do you sort of navigate that balance between using art to sort of engage with the struggles of the time or to sort of use it as like a form of escapism, either for yourself or for the audience? Tell me. I've been doing silly things like on my um, Instagram, I find the funniest memes and they could be political or just stupid. And I like posting them and like I've literally just done it for myself but now it's become a thing where people like literally send me private messages and they're like I had the worst day today and I just looked at your stories and I like I'm dying on the floor and like that right there because there's no pressure I just do it whenever I'm going to do it and people just follow me for that purpose and I just think just in in all the darkness there there is some type of humor it's like like everything's crazy. Like I just, <laughs> like we had a president or not me, but like they, the Eric's had a, like a whack ass president and that every day was a pure, pure jokes for me. And just like the, the, the creative people and the, there's so many comedians who are not supposed to be comedians who are just, and I just like, there's so much humor in life. And I just love putting that and posting that and sharing that kind of stuff because people literally just need to lift me up. And I, I have no apologies and I'll, I'll share everything. I personally love all the memes you post to your accounts. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anyone else want to go? Uh, Natalie, what do you, do you, how do you navigate about that? Sorry, I'm picking on you, but uh, just asking. Could you, could you rephrase the question, please? Yeah, it was sort of asking, how do you navigate sort of that balance between using your art to grapple with real life or to treat it as sort of a form of escapism? Right. Um, well, when I'm creating, I'm escaping into another world anyway. Um, that's what creativity is like for me. Uh, it's different for everybody, but um, it's, like, it's like entering into a different world. Um, you know, I also do commercial art, uh, you know, for children's books and advertising and, and whatever. Um, and that's a different beast altogether. And that's where, you're, you know, goes along with that being pushed but I do that for the money because <laughs> everybody's got to eat um, but then the art that I create for myself is strictly a, it's it's about me it's about the people I know it's about my life it's about my inward self and so that's where my escape is and the time that I spend in the studio doing that is a type of of I guess productive escapism if, if you will, um, because I'm doing what I really, really like and doing something that's authentic to, to my story. Um, it's my truth. So, um, 
yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, to me, there, there's, there's, uh, there is a difference between creating for like a commercial client, for example, versus creating for, um, you know, something that's, that's just for me, which is what my art is all about and whether it sells or not, but my art is just for me. And then whatever, whatever happens to it, it gets put out there. So. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, Sabi, Colton, uh, does anyone <laughs> want to? Just to write off of that with escapism, I feel like that's all of my music, but I've also found that in the pandemic, like I've been able to start writing for a lot of other people. And I was in a session last Friday and the music was definitely, it wasn't my typical cup of tea, it was hyper pop. And I went into the session thinking, okay, I'm gonna make a hyper, so a hyper pop song for me, even though I don't sing hyper pop. And I went and I'm like, oh my God, this is not for me. But I ended up coming out with like a really good song, but it just wasn't for me. And maybe it's for somebody else. So my escapism has been writing for other people, which has been so therapeutic. And yeah, I mean, bops are coming. <laughs> yeah, absolutely yeah. can't wait for the bops. Um, yeah, uh, Colton, do you? Um, yeah, it kind of just, that made me think about how the escapism sometimes is actually just in the creating itself. So I actually was taking commercial photos for a yoga teacher and she taught me this. She said, while you're behind the lens doing your job, just doing what you would think is A, B steps to do your job, you're actually in a sort of meditative flow. And it wasn't until she said that, that I was like, oh my God, absolutely. Like, that's totally it. Like, even in those commercial jobs, which we all have to do, um, I think, I think there's still part of, uh, I don't know, I think I still escape <laughs> even, but just by doing the work, you know, it's, we talk about the process a lot, but that's really where I feel the most comfortable and at ease and, um, where I feel like I escape is in the process of creating. So, um, yeah, that's, I think all I have to add to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, we're getting close to the end of the moderator panel. Um, so we're going to be heading over in about five minutes to the breakout rooms. Um, but with this group of amazing artists from very different disciplines, um, one of the questions kind of we want to uh, end on was that we've seen a lot of kind of innovation and experimentation within the world of art during the pandemic. Um, you know, I, you know, there has been, you know, <laughs> Zoom dance clubs, and there has been all kinds of fun new ways um, to enjoy and experience art. Um, with that in mind, what, you know, using your experiences, will the future look like? Like, will some of the changes that we have seen in the past nine months or in a year-ish, I guess, um, well, you know, will some of these changes we've seen in art platforms or art methods, will they become permanent or do you think that there will be more complete return to a, a pre-pandemic art that you know we'll return to once it becomes feasible again? Like what kind of what what's next for like the world of art? Do you think? Um, yeah, I. Oh, sorry, I feel like because we were so, it was almost like survival of the fittest kind of thing. So I feel like a lot of it's gonna just hold, um, like. I've got, I, I've had opportunities to meet so many people I, like I was trying to meet in person, literally on, online. And like, like those things are available and people, I, I think people are gonna like to do that. Um, like, and then like um, Sab was saying about her music sessions, like, like I would love to go to LA <laughs> and like, and do that. But like now it's so easy just to set up like a little Zoom thing and, and then do it right there. So I really feel like a lot of our methods will like hold. And um, I don't know, it's like the old ways, like <laughs> like grab a phone when I call up someone. Like I, I've, I've always been that, like, I've, like there's a text person and there's a call person and I'd rather call and see you. Um, and I, I, I wanna hold on to some of that still, like because like literally me before and me now are very different, th different people. Like after, after the year that passed and then now I've accomplished so many like these side pro um, projects and hustles and stuff like that, I've like done so, almost so much more um, than I would do in a year, like physically without burning out myself. Right. Yeah, Colton, I think you were gonna jump in before you want to say something. Um, in terms of theater, there's no way we are going back to the way it used to be. And I think that's 
thank God. Um, I think we are all going to be, we all are so different than we were a year ago. Um, and I think we're all better off because of it. I know it's been a hell of a year, but I think the change that we're starting to see, I hope is that it, I hope it sticks. Um, and I don't mean so much in the way that I think eventually we'll be able to sit in a theater again, you know, just like we'll be able to sit in, in a nightclub or, you know, in a music studio. Um, uh, however, I think the way that that institution works is going to be completely different, um, I hope. And that makes me excited. That's my short answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. Um, in the last like, two minutes, Natalie or Tabby, do you have anything you want to add about you know, how your field or kind of how you think things will turn out? Do you want to go first, Sabby? No, you have your mic. You can go first. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, I think I think there's there's some stuff is going to stick and some stuff will just fall behind. It just depends on on, you know, I guess the medium and and what it is that we're trying to see. Um, what I do hope sticks is the newfound respect for the arts, because people are realizing that without the arts, I don't think they would have been able to survive the pandemic nearly as well as they did. Um, yeah, so, you know, I hope that that respect doesn't fall to the wayside. Um, in terms of the technology, I think it's going to evolve. Um, of course, there'll be some good, some bad. We'll see where that goes. Um, it's hard to say where it will go, but hopefully, hopefully uh, it's always done with that, you know, let's respect the people who helped us through this. You know, um, and that's, you know, the actors. I mean, how many TV shows and Netflix and all that kind of stuff that people actually binge watched, you know, um, and all the, the, the stuff and the people that goes behind that, you know, we need to we need to really rethink the way the structures are built to be able to support artists more strongly in Canada anyway. So that's yeah. my thought. Super, super important message. Um, and then Sabi, last, last thought. Uh, I can't finish that off. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, you really like brought it home with that one. So I give it to you. <laughs> Fair enough. It, it was a great way to end the moderated panel on. Um, but fortunately, the, uh, we still have half an hour left. So what happens now is that we are going into the breakout rooms. So everyone will have been pre-sorted into a breakout room. And so for the next 25 minutes, the audience members will have a chance to ask questions and chat with the art themselves. So you will hopefully see you soon in the momentarily, see a breakout room and to join um, and enjoy the next five minutes and then we'll reconvene after. My drag wall. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It's so pretty. Mm -hmm. I couldn't look good on now. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Hello. Wow, well, that's pretty fancy how that works automatically, eh? Mm -hmm. Yes, I like that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, good evening, everyone. Um, once again, my name is Zane, and I'm the co editor in chief of Demo, which is Hard House's music magazine. So this has been an incredibly interesting discussion, providing some much needed insight into how artists have been innovating and adapting in what is undoubtedly an incredibly tumultuous period. So indeed, in times of crisis, most of us do turn to the arts for comfort. I know Natalie, you spoke about that from something like watching a warm and familiar TV show to listening to our favorite albums. So hopefully this inspires us to continue to support the arts, uh, to encourage creativity, curiosity, growth, and expression. So first and foremost, I would really like to just thank all of our panelists, Colton, Natalie, Savvy, and Tainomi, and my co-moderator, Keenan, on behalf of the Hard House Debates and Dialogues Committee and Demo, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and time with us and guiding this important conversation. And finally, thank you to Hard House, the committee members who have worked so hard to put this event together. And of course, thank you, our audience, for joining us today. I really hope that you had an engaging and thoughtful 
thought-provoking discussion. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's chat, please look out for Hard House Debates and Dialogues next event on the 9th of March, um, which is about China's uh, Uyghur concentration camps, the ignored genocide. Um, and finally, look out for the special 2021 Spirit Edition of Demo Magazine coming out this March. Thank you so good, so much, guys. Um, once again, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so everybody. much. It's great meeting everybody. Yes, yeah, so nice <laughs> meeting everybody. Thank you. Great meeting everyone. Mm -hmm.